you hear me now? All right. Technical difficulties. We love it, right? All right. So I think we're recording and back up and ready to go. All right. Well, praise praise the Lord. Yeah. This morning we are starting part two of our sermon series that we've began last week called Disillusioned. And we've been talking about doubt. We've been talking about how doubt is, is sometimes a prevalent part of our walk and relationship with Christ. It's something that we wrestle with. And, and last week we talked a little bit about sometimes we we may feel like doubt is something that is something we shouldn't experience and something that we may feel embarrassed that we have questions or doubt. But I think last week we tried to to talk about and discover that doubt can propel us into a deeper, more intimate walk with Jesus. Because if we're honestly coming before him and asking these questions and struggling with him honestly and not in an accusatory way, but honestly seeking him, that he draws us all the more into a deeper and deeper walk with him. And so this week, we're going to continue that series. I've entitled this message today, The Wrong View. And today we're going to be talking a little bit more into this idea of how doubt creeps into other parts of our life. And doubt this week into our relationships, and especially into our relationship with Jesus. Our text for today is going to be out of Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at the passages or verses 13 through 28. So if you have your Bibles and want to find that, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 28. It all starts with relationships. Every Everything significant in our lives, as as we look at it, starts with a relationship. And at the end of the day, our faith, our family, our work, the things we lead, all of those things are based on who you relate to and how you relate to others. Our life, when we look at it, is motivated by a love for others. Being part of a family, uh, a desire for intimacy, vulnerability, choosing to work on a great team, creating a project or a product or service that helps others, all of those things are motivated by relationships. And we are happiest when we know our lives revolve around these relationships. When those relationships are good and healthy, that's when we tend to be the most healthy. On the other hand, we're not ourselves when, um, especially not the best version of ourselves, when we're isolated in those relationships, when we feel alone, when we have doubt or mistrust in those relationships. Almost everything we do as we think about our life and the way we live it is affected and touched in relationships in some way. Think about your day, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, driving your car, (laughs) playing, exercising, whatever it is, any part of it, you're doing it, it's revolving around relationships. We are constantly involved with other people. We even interact with people in our sleep. How many of you have dreams about something happening with other people? Okay, everybody, I think, I don't know, I don't remember too many dreams, but oftentimes it, yeah, when I think about it, it's affected with other people. So there's no escaping these relationships. So again, last week we talked briefly about how frustration and even doubt creeps into our lives through unmet expectations, right? Our relationships work much the same way. This, I'm sure, is nothing new for many of you, but I remember when I first realized this. We were newly married, and we had been arguing about something that wasn't that big of a deal at all. Yes, I know the argument was my fault. I'm acknowledging it now, and I'm getting to that part. But as I ask myself, why am I so upset about this? I think the Lord revealed this insight to me, that we can grow frustrated 
mistrust develops, bitterness can set in when we have these unmet expectations. I also realize it's important to be basing our expectations on the right things. And a fundamental phrase, as we are familiar with, with church life, a fundamental phrase for the life of the Christian is having a relationship with God. You guys have, are all familiar with that phrase. But sometimes we bring our own expectations to our relationship with God. We create this view or this schematic even of what or how we think our relationship with God should look like and how it should operate. And when God doesn't perform the way that we think he should, we become frustrated, right? We doubt. We doubt his loyalty. We doubt his presence. We doubt that he even really loves us sometimes. We can get to where we really get into a real dark place. So when we think about this, when we understand this relationship with God and and we become frustrated in that, we have these unmet expectations, we feel abandoned. And we can begin to feel isolated. I remember uh, when my kids were real little, they would uh, play pretend. You know, they would play house. They would play, I don't know, kind of superheroes or whatever, all kinds of different things. And they had these roles that they would assign to one another, right? You've seen kids do this. And and it's kind of funny. And, And you can, some of them will grow a little bit frustrated when one doesn't do what the other one thinks they should do right? You're not doing it right. You're not saying that thing right. Um, I remember reading stories to my kids and, and I would mess with them a little bit, you know, because there was some of these stories they really liked. And um, I would read them with certain voices, read certain characters, you know, they would say certain things in a certain voice. And if I didn't read that right, they would stop me. Dad, you need to read it right. You need to read it with the voice. And so, you know, you just had to you know, kind of play into that. And so oftentimes I think we can kind of relate to that as well, that when, when we complain to God in those ways, you're not doing it right. You guys ever find yourself doing that? Complaining and and maybe even stopping and interrupting, whoa, 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 you're not doing it right. We see in the Gospels, that sometimes the disciples did this to Jesus. Jesus was constantly challenging the disciples' expectations of what, was God, of what God was going to do in the world. One exchange shows Peter being corrected by Jesus. And this is where we jump into Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 28. This morning, I want to look at the life of Peter and how he wrestled with these unmet expectations in his growing relationship with Jesus. As we look at this passage, we begin with Peter making this profession of faith about Jesus Christ. And I honestly believe that it came from a position in his heart of genuine love for Jesus and a genuine realization of who he is. And so in this passage, Peter makes this confession of Christ. But Jesus had to constantly... Had he, he had to distinguish between the nature of God's kingdom and the role of the Messiah. For the second temple Jews that, that Jesus was interacting with at this time, their belief and their view and their understanding of the Messiah was a military king who were to free this group of people from the Romans and establish a new national kingdom. But throughout the ministry of Jesus, the, the disciples repeatedly try to align Jesus with this expectation. If you look at Luke chapter 22 or John 18, we see where Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier. And then what does Jesus do? He heals that ear. Because Jesus was was interrupting that expectation. Because what Peter was doing when he cut off that ear of that soldier I think in his heart and his mind, he was ushering in something different than what Jesus was intending to do. And even just before Jesus ascended to heaven, his disciples were asking if he was going to set up his kingdom. And we read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, 
Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? But Jesus told them to wait for the Holy Spirit and that they would be his witnesses to the world. Jesus wasn't concerned about setting up these powerful political kingdoms. So as we read Acts, 7, Acts 1, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we see where, what Jesus' intention was, and then we begin to interact with what Peter, Peter's response to Jesus. And so let's read Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus warned the disciples not to publicize Peter's confession because I think Jesus knew and the disciples, they had not fully realized that the kind of Messiah that Jesus actually was coming to be. He was not going to be this military commander, but actually come as a suffering servant. And so Jesus is, is already setting the stage to, to change their perspective and idea of what this relationship with him was going, going to look like. They needed to come to this full understanding of Jesus and their mission as disciples before they could go and proclaim it to others in the way that would not cause a rebellion. They would have a difficult time understanding what Jesus came to do until his earthly mission was complete. And when I'm thinking about this passage and I think about what Peter did, I can identify with Peter in a lot of ways. And in fact, oftentimes I find myself identifying with Peter pretty often. But here I, I think about Peter and I think about what he did. And he, and he confessed Christ. He acknowledged who Jesus is. But then he wrestled with the way that this relationship was then going to start changing his life. He realized his expectations and his perspectives weren't going to be met and that they needed to change. And I realized that sometimes I need that realignment in my own life, that I can, can, can confess Christ. I recognize who he is. He is the Messiah. He is my Savior. But then I try to maneuver and manipulate him into my own agenda. And I try to make him do something that he never came to do. I try to make him do something less. And he misses it. I miss it. I misunderstand what he's doing. And I become frustrated. And I find myself isolating myself from it. And oftentimes, the motivations I have in my perspective of who Jesus is, is selfishness. And at the root of that is sin. So those things get in the way. They change the perspective of who Jesus is and what he came to do. As we look at verse 21, there's an interesting phrase that begins this part of the passage. It says, from that time on. This is a pivot point as we, as we look at, at the narrative of, of the gospel here in Matthew. This is something where Jesus changes 
his message in some ways. Let's begin reading verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem for many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. That had to be a tense exchange. If you're imagining the things that are happening in this passage. The phrase from that time on is this turning point. If you look back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it signaled Jesus' announcement of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 17 of chapter 4 says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But as we look at verse 21, it points to this new emphasis on his death and on his resurrection. The disciples still didn't grasp Jesus' true purpose because of their preconceived notions about what the Messiah should be. And this is the first of three times that Jesus predicted his death. If you turn to Matthew chapter 17 and 22, verse 23, and then to chapter 20, verse 18, in those three instances, he again proclaims this. Peter, Jesus' friend. And we can say that with confidence that Peter was Jesus' friend. He was a devoted follower. And just previously, he had eloquently proclaimed Jesus' true identity. He sought to protect him from the suffering that Jesus was prophesying. We have the, the fortune of being on this side of history and seeing that if Jesus hadn't suffered and died, Peter and us also we would have died in our sins. So we, uh, we can understand, we have this perspective now that we know why Jesus did what he had to do. But Peter didn't understand that at that point. I got to thinking about that relationship and I got to thinking about that exchange that, that Jesus and Peter had. Have you ever thought about how great temptations can come from those who love us and seek to protect us? Now, that doesn't sound like that's a bad thing, right? And I think Peter, his motivation and what he said to Jesus came from a place of love and concern. But do we think about or begin to think about some of the relationships we have with others in our own lives? Have you ever received advice from others as you're facing something that's hard and difficult? Surely God doesn't want you to face this when you know that you need to do a certain thing that's going to be hard and difficult, that's going to um, maybe cause some own personal pain and discomfort and have others come alongside, are you sure that that's what God wants you to do? Well, that's essentially what, what Peter did here with Jesus. Our most difficult temptations come from those who are only trying to protect us from discomfort. And our human nature, our tendency is to avoid embarrassment, pits to our pride, right? We want to avoid those things. But then think back to the very temptations that Jesus faced earlier in Matthew's gospel. Jesus heard the message that he could achieve greatness without dying. These were one of the very things that Satan tempt him, tempted him with. If you look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, Satan says this, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus heard the same message from Peter. Peter had just recognized Jesus as Messiah. However, he took God's perspective 
and evaluated the, the situation from a human one. Satan is always trying to work and get us to, to leave God out of the picture. And Jesus rebuked Peter for this attitude. And we see here in, in Peter's response to Jesus that he is following a different view of Jesus, a different idea of what Jesus came to do and what he came to accomplish. And I could even argue maybe even a different Jesus altogether. So what Jesus am I following? Beginning in 16, verse 24, Jesus says this. He said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When Jesus used this picture of his followers taking up their cross, they were familiar with that imagery. They understood what that meant. Crucifixion was a common method of execution in this Roman regime. Condemned criminals had to carry their crosses through the streets to their execution site. It was part of the shame of what they were to endure. So, following Jesus meant a true commitment, the risk of death, and no turning back. The disciples understood this imagery. They also understood that the possibility of losing their lives was very real, as much as it was for Jesus. Real discipleship implies real commitment, pledging our whole existence to his service. If we try to save our physical life from death, from pain, from discomfort, we may risk losing our true eternal life. If we protect ourselves from pain, we begin to die spiritually and emotionally, and our lives turn inward. We turn to more selfish. We lose our intended purpose and what God has intended for us to live out in this relationship with him. But when we give our lives in service to Christ, we discover the real purpose of living. And the disciples were discovering this for themselves. For them to risk their very lives following this Jesus, they needed to be certain that they were rooted and established in God's perspective, his purpose and his plan being worked out through Jesus. All of their eggs were in this basket. There was no plan B. It was all or nothing. When we don't know Christ, we make choices through life as, as selfishly as we want, with the intentions that we want. But when we follow Jesus, we have to have a different perspective. We have to be committed. We have to be willing to have the perspective that he has. And the disciples were working their way through this process. And today, for us, as believers, we have, again, this privilege of being on this side of history and can see the story unfold and know what the end looks like. But as we live this relationship with Jesus today, we have some unknowns and some unexpected things before us. And so I want to ask you, what version of Jesus are you following today? What kind of box are you trying to stuff him into? What kind of plan are you trying to manipulate him into leading you through? That doesn't sound like the kind of Jesus that we read in Scripture. That's not 
the relationship that he desires for us. So as we think about this today, as we think about relationships, as we think about expectations, as we think about sometimes a frustration, at least for me, that I find and see in my own life, as I struggle with which version of Jesus I'm trying to follow, I want to invite him today to search and evaluate my heart. That my perspective is right. That it's rooted and grounded in him. That it's not based on my own selfishness. It's not based on sin. That it's not based on my own agenda. But it's allowing him to shape that and form that in me. I want to pray for you and invite Emily and Jenny to come back up. And we're going to sing that song again. I love you, Lord. And as we we think about that, again, it's a simple declaration of our love for him based on who he is. Not the version that we are making him to be. So would you pray with me today that God would search our hearts. Reveal to us what version of him we're following today. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we're so thankful. We're thankful for your word and we're thankful for what we can see happen and unfold through scripture. Help us today, Lord, as we are endeavoring to live this relationship out with you to have the right perspective to have the right version of you in our hearts and minds that we're not following some selfish version some manipulated version but one that's rooted and grounded in the Jesus we see in scripture the suffering servant, the one that came to love and to heal, the one that has a kingdom perspective. Help us today, Lord, to have that same version, that same vision. Help us today, Lord, search our hearts, reveal anything in us that doesn't belong, Give us the courage to confess it and ask that you would give us the right perspective. Do that in my own heart today. I pray and I ask these things, Father, in your name. Amen.
second John is our event based on traditional fiction. From second John, beginning in verse six. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his commands is that you walk in love. May that be true today as we leave here. You are blessed. Have a great week.